part three of our um, series on straight shooter, which is James. And uh, this one is called Sin Within. Uh, there's a story of a man walking along the road. He goes past a church on a Sunday and he sees a devil sitting on the wall crying his eyes out. And uh, the man says, what on earth is wrong with you? And he says, they're all blaming me in there for everything. The devil does tempt us, but he's not the only source of temptation. And the devil is definitely in the mix when you sin. But he can't make you sin if you're a believer. And when you sin, James really says, it's on you. He starts at the beginning of this letter by speaking about trials in general and that we need to know that God is working in us, through us and with us while we're actually in the trial and the suffering. And when we understand that, we can look beyond the trial and know a kind of pure inner joy, a deep-seated knowledge, because God is using that trial to make us more like Jesus. Even in the mess, he is working things in us. And so James then moves on from different kinds of trials in a, diff, in a general sense, and his comments on that in verse 2, to specific types of trial. And the last time, last week, was the challenge of poverty and not being able to make ends meet. And also the challenge of being able to make things meet and being financially okay. And how both situations actually must humble us and throw us upon the Lord. But now he moves on to temptation and sin, which, let's face it, is an ongoing thing for most believers, all believers, in Jesus. First thing I want to say, though, before we get mixed up here, and it's easy to get mixed up, is that being tempted itself isn't sin. Some people come to me and they feel terrible because they're being tempted. Not a problem. It's only sin when you give in to temptation. But being tempted itself is not a sin. So away with false guilt, first of all. Martin Luther said this, no, not Martin Luther King. And he said this, you can't keep birds flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. They won't get very far with Alex and me and Bear and Corin, uh, but everybody else should be all right. So you can't keep the birds from building a nest in your hair. And what he means by that is, oh and Ian, he got away with it. What he means by that is, you can't keep the devil from suggesting thoughts, but you can choose not to dwell or act on them. That's what he means by making a nest. And James is a bit confusing in this chapter because James uses the word tempted to mean when we give in to temptation. He doesn't believe that temptation itself is a sin, but he uses it in the sense that it's leading to being given in to temptation. So remember that when we're talking about this. But when, he's talking about when we sin after yielding to temptation, but he uses the word tempted. Now, with temptation, okay, we've talked about blaming the devil. Who else can we blame? Well, when we give in to temptation, who else can we blame? Well, definitely, James says, not God. It seems obvious, doesn't it? But let me explain. 1 13 of James says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. <clears throat> we live in a society that loves to blame. Anyone or anything we will blame but ourselves. Politicians rarely own up. We've seen that even more so, haven't we, of a recent time. Police chiefs, very rarely do they stand up. Uh, local councils, social services, criminals, lawyers. Rarely does anyone confess, fess up and say, no, no, that's my fault. But it's also true of Christians and you and me at times. It's easy to point the finger, you'll get three fingers pointing back. 
No one likes being blamed. No one likes being accused. But when it's your fault, when it's my fault, we have to own up and take responsibility for our actions. That's always the case. And James is really hammering this home today. <clears throat> but yet sometimes we can be tempted and blame God for the temptation, and especially when we give in to temptation. Let me give you an example. What did you, God, expect me to do when you let this and that happen in my life? That person, God, you brought in my life was too much for me to handle, so no wonder I snapped. What else can I do? Yes, I looked at porn. I'm a virile young man or woman. Or I might be old. But you haven't provided a spouse for me. Or if you have, she doesn't want it much. Or he. What do you expect, God, when you put these pressures on me? You see, we do do that sometimes. And it goes right to the beginning when the very first sin entered our world. The very first blame game. God gives Adam a chance to own up and take responsibility. What does Adam do? He blames Eve, but more to the point, he blames God for his own sin. Genesis 3.12, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. It's Eve's fault, yes it is, but it's also your fault, God. Well, he was happy about it in Genesis 2 when she came and he went, well, hey. But now he's not happy. If you hadn't created her and put her with me, I wouldn't have given in to temptation and sin. So don't blame me, God. Don't come after me. Does that sound familiar? Why, God? She or he incited me. They pushed me over the edge and tempted me until I snapped. And if you hadn't put her or him in my life, I wouldn't have been tempted and I wouldn't have given in and sinned. So it's your fault. If you hadn't allowed this awful trial or that awful trial, I wouldn't have given in to the pressure and taken things into my own hands. It's your fault. Blaming God and accusing God is a complete lie. And it is a tactic to avoid responsibility for our own sin. Why is it a lie? And why, why is it untrue? Because God hasn't got an evil bone in his body. Verse 13, For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. It is impossible for God to give in to temptation. It's impossible for God to sin. Therefore, how can he tempt anyone else to sin? It's not in his nature. He is 100% pure through and through. We can present ourselves, can't we, outwardly as pure, but inside there's a can of worms sometimes. He is pure through and through. He is flawless. He is transparent. His purity burns like the sun shining in all its brilliance, as the Bible says. And even the sinless heavenly beings can't bear to look on him. They cover their faces and they cover their feet and they're on the move all the time, almost a shield from the blazing searchlight of his holy gaze. And they are without sin. Isaiah 6, which John says was Jesus. And he appears in the temple and we read, Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty and the whole earth is full of his glory and yet they could not look on him. It is impossible for God to be tempted or to tempt. And let me tell you this, it is never his fault. And that's hard to swallow sometimes when we're into the blame. And every time I think it is his fault, or you think it is his fault, you end up wishing you'd never thought it, and you'd never said it, and you'd never acted on it. 
We see this with Job, who's in deep suffering, untold suffering, other than the cross, probably the worst kind of suffering anybody goes through, lost the whole lot. And he says out of his suffering in Job 30-something that he will defend his ways to God's face. Show yourself, God. Come on. But when he finally comes face to face with God, it is a inc- very, very different story. Job 42, 3, he says to God, You asked, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, he says to God, listen now, and I will speak, and I will question you, and you shall answer me. And then he says, my ears has heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Response, therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. That was the conclusion he comes to. You see, we will soon or eventually come to realize that the things that happen to us are never God's fault. The things we do that are sinful are never God's fault. Yes, the devil tempts, but if you give in to it, you're to blame, not the devil. Yes, others can come into your life and test and tempt and wind you up, but if you crack, that's on you. And no, God can't be tempted and never tempts. He is blameless. The uh, Bible says, 1 John 1, 5, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. What's an awesome fact about God? And then in verse 14, let me remind you again, James uses tempted to mean when we give in to temptation. Being tempted itself isn't sin. When we sin after being tempted, that's sin. And then he bores right in, drills right into the center of the cause of sin. Sin comes from within. And what I want to say is this, beware, because you yourself can be your own worst enemy, and goodness knows I can Verse 14, but each one is tempted, gives in to temptation, when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. I don't know whether any of you used to watch Tom and Jerry, the old, old ones. It always had to be Fred Quimby, the new ones, Hannah Barbara, they were dreadful. And they started talking, that doesn't happen in Tom and Jerry. Anyway, Tom and Jerry, they were, they were so good. And Tom's the cat, and Jerry's the mouse, right? And Jerry's walking along, minding his own business. Uh, with, you know, you should have the little musical notes coming out. Only Scott could discern what they might be. And, um, and he, he, was, he, was, he was whistling along, and then suddenly he catches this aroma and this beautiful smell of food cooking, and it completely changes his direction. And then he's led by his nose, isn't he? And what he doesn't know is he's being led into danger because Tom the cat is there with the frying pan, (laughs) ready to squash him and put him in it. Exactly. Each one gives into temptation wine by his own evil desire. He's dragged away and enticed. And then James goes into a very ugly process of how sin develops. Verse 15, then after desire has conceived, that evil desire, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. When you embrace that temptation, when you start to muse on it, to think on it, to desire it because it's something that appeals to you, James is almost saying that the sin baby is conceived. And this baby is the ugliest baby you've ever seen. All babies look like Winston Churchill when they're first born. 
that this baby is perpetually evil and therefore ugly. And it's conceived once it's embraced in the mind and then it births sin which springs into action and, and is brought to life, into your life and mine. And the sin baby, you see, quickly grows outside and comes out in our talk and in our walk. And the sin baby keeps growing outside the womb of the mind with which it was conceived and embraced and matures into an adult very quickly. And if it's kept alive, it kills. It kills. That's what the sin baby does. It grows up and it is programmed to destroy. The wages of sin is death. And James is saying it all begins by your own evil desire within, which then conceives the sin. And the rest is history if you don't kill it. And in the context of what James is saying, there are two things that I don't believe we should ever believe as believers. <laughs> Sorry, that's not how I wrote it down. There's two things that we must never believe that the world tells us to believe. And the first one is follow your heart. For goodness sake. First of all, you can argue it depends which heart. Okay, let's get this one out of the way. If you live out of the new heart, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness, all well and good, but you know very well that the old heart and the sinful nature is often in the mix somewhere. Not always. And here's what that heart's like. Jeremiah tells us the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked, and beyond cure. And here's a word to the counsellors. Who can understand it? Now, I'm not saying counsel's rubbish. Mary, you know what I mean. I do get myself into trouble, don't I? The other thing is this. The only one you can ever trust is yourself. Lean on yourself. Trust yourself. No, thank you. No, thank you. Can you really trust yourself? I can't. Why? Because of the same reason. The sinful nature is deceitful above all things. Who can know and understand it? I kid myself. I deceive myself. I have arguments with myself. And I lose. You see, the devil too hops on. And he has some incredibly clever arguments, but then so does your old self. Incredible arguments to get you to succumb and sin. And, he's, and let me tell you, the devil has got nothing on your own sinful nature because when they team up together, they're the dream team of evil. And if you agree, you're on a one-way street. And they're all clapping and laughing along the way. You and I have to develop, and James is helping us, a high-security intruder system alarm which gives you warning flags and sounds the bell in your head to warn you when your sinful nature rises up. And here's the main thing. As the Puritans used to say, yes, they didn't have zips, they only had buttons, never mind any of that. If in doubt, don't. That's what they said. If in doubt, don't. Now, if you're anything like me, you start justifying something in your head. And really, you, you've entered into a discussion that you're never going to win. It's not usually a good sign to start justifying things, certain thoughts. Sometimes we can be, begin to look at our old sins and think, hmm, I was extreme in those days, though, wasn't I? In those early days, I, I don't think it's wrong now. You actually know it's wrong, but you're playing with yourself. And we look at the sinful past with rose-tinted specks, don't we, sometimes? And we can only see the good. And we're blinded to what nearly killed us. That's why we have to beware of ourselves. And sometimes, you know, you're there, I've done it as well, and you think of reasons why I shouldn't forgive so-and-so, because they're an idiot. Or because they said this, or they did that, or they really deeply hurt me. Or they said, our friendship of 20 years is on the line. <laughs> this isn't you, Scott. <laughs> our friendship of 20 years is on the line just because we disagreed. <laughs> that killed. 
So I'm thinking, I'm not going to forgive. And you're rehearsing what you'll say and what you'll do because that will teach them. You see, your sinful nature is much, much cleverer than you, you are and than I am. It will outmove me every time. You know what you do? You don't engage. You put to death. You choose life. And yes, you live out of the new heart and you kill any semblance and vestiges of the old. There's that old adage, isn't there, as two dogs, one's red, one's white. Which one's the strongest, says this person. And the other one says, it just depends on who you feed. Sin's a killer. And the only way to stop it growing is to kill it and to crucify it. It's a bit like the bully who closes in on you and there's no escape. My dad said, you've got to get in first, you've got to hit him as hard as you can, and then you've got to run. I put that into practice after being bullied repeatedly at school. He never came back. Third time lucky. I thought, I'm not having this anymore because he'll keep coming back. He'll keep coming back. So I engaged. I knocked him down. He knocked me down. We were best friends after that. Funny, isn't it? That sin, you see. Kill or be killed. James says in verse 15, Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. That's how you deal with your sinful heart. Never trust it, never engage with it, never follow it. Paul said this, didn't he? Romans seven eighteen. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. But here's the encouragement. And here's our focus to end. Trust in God, for he gives only good gifts to it. He doesn't know how to give bad gifts. He gives only good gifts to his children. You can give bad gifts to yourself. (laughs) It's not in him. Verse 15. Uh, 16. Do not be deceived then, my dear brothers, because they were saying, God's tempting me and blah, blah, blah. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Basically, he's saying this. God is not the author of evil. The devil is. God has no sinful nature. You do. God never changes, is always and forever good, And you can be up and down like a dog's leg. And you can be thoroughly inconsistent. And so can I. You see, what he's really saying here for our encouragement is that sin births only death. But God births everlasting life. Verse 18, he chose, that's God, to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits, a new offspring of all that he created. If you've heard the word of truth today and you've come through the cross of Christ and you've asked for forgiveness and new life, remember this, you are not the one you used to be. You are not what you once were, you have been spiritually reborn within. How? When you heard, James says, the word of truth, and you believed it, and you accepted it, and you embraced it, and you obeyed the call to Christ. Jesus says this, I tell you the truth. He's not a liar. Whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has, past tense, eternal life. That's what you've got boiling inside of you now. Has eternal life. And you will not, in the future, be condemned. He has, past tense, crossed over from death to life. Do you believe that? 
Jesus says it's the truth. And then God says, Acts 26, 18, I will turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God and a hallelujah. And then Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation because the old has gone and the new has come. And I think this is a reference to the first creation. It's contrasted. You see, once this earth was lifeless and uncreated, whatever you believe how that happened, I don't know. And then we read the Spirit of God hovered over the waters waiting for the command. And when it came, he created new life. And so as you came to Christ, the Spirit had drawn you and he's hovering over you. And then as soon as you call upon Christ, he creates an all new you inside. You're the new creation. And on that day, no matter how rubbish your family was, you're born into his family. No matter how you've been treated, he's now your dad. Get it into your mind. He becomes your father, and you're his child. So forget the past rubbish and focus on who you are now. Because you're born into a new humanity. The first fruits of the new creation, born from above. You are a different and new human race, heading to a wonderful and glorious conclusion. You are now one that lives beyond the grave. You are now one that defeats and overcomes sin. And when one day we'll live in a new world, this present world will dissolve like snow, we say. There will be no more presence in that new world, or power, or penalty of sin, and no more Satan. Hallelujah. I want to read you one of my favorite lines of a very old hymn. It's got a dingy old tune, but it's a, this is the thing with these hymns. They, I love some of the old hymns, but the words are sublime. Listen to it. Sin, my worst enemy before, shall vex my eyes and ears no more. My inward foes shall all be slain, nor Satan break my peace again. Can I get an army? Now, now that we've set that glorious scene, let me say this. Some Christians still play with the things of death. They live too near the grave. Why? Because they have forgotten. You have forgotten. I have forgotten sometimes just who I now am. Let me say this, Christian. Stay away from the grave. Why? Because you're now risen. The grave and the things of the grave are no longer your playthings. They were, they're not now. Paul says, Romans 6, 21, what benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death, which is what James is saying. You see, like Lazarus, Jesus commanded your dead spirit to rise and come out of the tomb, didn't he? And like Lazarus, he took off your old grave clothes spiritually because no one who's been raised to new life clothes themselves again with the things of death. And he covered you with a new garment. His very own hard-earned perfect righteousness as a gift wrapped around your cold body just risen from the grave like a warm winter coat never to be taken off again. Amen. Garments of new life and not death. He gave you, Ephesians 4, 24, the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That heart desires, loves, 
and is created to be like God. So why live out of the heart of sin and death? I speak to myself. You see, he filled us with power from on high. That's what Jesus said. You will be clothed with power from on high. Well, it's happened. You have the same spirit, Ephesians and Romans say, who raised Christ from the dead and ascended him and seated him next to the Father in the glory. The very same spirit is now coursing through your spiritual veins. So what's the problem? It's because we forget who we are. Because sin and death are no longer worthy of you. Remember when that man with leprosy came to Jesus and he knelt before Jesus and he said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man and said, I am willing, be clean. (laughs) You heard that, I heard that. We hear it every day. Be clean. That's you if you're a believer. You see, Christ was always enough. His word is enough. His spirit is enough. The love of the Father is enough. You have all you need to slay sin and live for Christ. But when you do sin, which you will sometimes, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, who forgives instantly, completely, and refuses to call to mind your sin ever again, is the one that absolves you. Remember, he remembers your sin no more. He doesn't forget Because if you forget, you'll remember. He chooses in his sovereignty to blank it out of his mind forevermore. It doesn't exist. And that's all that matters. Who cares whether you think, well, they care, but you you go to God, don't you, and say, I'm so sorry, God, for something you did five minutes ago. You'd already confessed it. The first time you've forgiven. The second time he says, what are you on about? I don't remember that. It doesn't exist. The best thing about Tozer, well, there's many good things about Tozer, let's face it, He says, your past life is Christ's past life. Your present life is Christ's present life. And your future life is Christ's future life. You are squeaky clean. Your sin no longer exists. You're covered by the garment of righteousness. That's who you are now, right? So please bore it into your head and mind. Because I forget. I bet you do. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Have you forgotten who you now are in Jesus. Then remember again, everything's at your disposal. Live for him. You are the first fruits of all he created, the firstborn, the new humanity, the children of the resurrection, the apple of his eye. Let me say this in closing. Sins that may have clung to you for years can fall away. It's true. And don't always think, well, that happened for Simon, but it's not going to happen for me. Oh, no. There's no exception. They can and will fall away. Remove the veil, it's on you. Old habits die hard. Yes, they do, but in Christ they will die and be replaced with glorious new habits that are great fun. And chains can and will be broken. And freedom, and if the sun sets you free, you will be... You see, the trouble with Christians, as Max Lucado said this, they have a nasty habit of rising again. (laughs) And that's in this life. You're risen. And as Johnny Cash says, ain't no grave can hold this body down. So isn't it time now, and I speak to myself, to turn from sin and sinful desires And turn to Jesus and holy desires. Because sin promises everything and you know it delivers nothing. Jesus promises everything and he has delivered, he will deliver and continues to deliver every good and perfect gift. Can we, in September, where we're stepping up, can we all get on board? Can we join his new creation if you haven't yet? Or if you have joined, get back on the road to life and glory. Let me finish with this great psalm which I often meditate upon when I'm feeling incredibly miserable and I can't see any point in anything. I don't enjoy life. This is what I look at. Psalm 1611. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures. Where? At your right hand. 
That's it. We're fiddling about with mud pies and everything because we've never been for a holiday at the sea. Praise the Lord Jesus for all that he's done. May we be fired up. May we remember who we are. May we perpetually remind ourselves when we're down on ourselves and when we look at sin within and forget to look at the Savior, then God forbid, uh, help us to be on the straight and narrow looking to him. Away with shame, away with guilt, away with when God remembers your sin no more and you still remember it. No, no, (laughs) don't. Crucify it. When the devil comes and says, yeah, but you do this, you do that. Oh, well. When he reminds you... What am I going on about? I'm just going to keep going. Somebody shut me up. Let's pray. Father, forgive me for getting in the way sometimes. Um, But Lord, we just pray that we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for the power. We pray, as many of us here are already raised within, help us to act like we are. Help us to trust in your power, not ourselves. Help us to crucify the flesh or the sinful nature. Live out of the new by the power of the Spirit. Uh, I love the verse that says the sinful nature and the Spirit and the Spirit and the sinful nature are at war with each other and the Spirit wars against the flesh so that you do not do what you want. Yes, come on. We thank you. We thank you so much. We're so grateful. In Jesus' name. Amen.